Uh, here we are with the Northwest Fest 2021 online uh, filmmaker interview series. Uh, I'm thrilled, very excited. I've been looking forward to this one. Thrilled today to be joined by Kevin Smokler and Christopher Boone, the filmmakers of the wonderful, wonderful Vinyl Nation. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me <laughs> live via satellite. <laughs> oh, thanks, Guy. It's great to be here. And, and we're really excited about what you guys are doing. Yeah, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I really, um, I really wish you guys could be here in in person. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the uh, the card that's been dealt to us these days. So before we get into a few of the questions I have, just uh, uh, first off, just tell folks a little bit about Vinyl Nation and what the film's all about. Yeah, this is Kevin. Um, Vinyl Nation is a 92-minute documentary about the comeback of vinyl records, which has happened over the last 15 years, beginning in 2008. I guess that's the last 13 years. It just doesn't sound as fun to say it that way. Um, and uh, moreover, it's really about the connective power of music and how vinyl records are, are black plastic metaphors for human connection. Well, that needs to be on the poster. So I, I think I might have told you guys this in, in one of our email exchanges. I'm not sure. But so I'm a lifelong uh, music and vinyl junkie um, because I'm old enough to have collected vinyl, you know, the first time around <laughs> um, and and then loaded up on a lot of vinyl when it was all going out of print uh, and Lucky now we find it all at 10 times the amount. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so. It, it, do both of you share a background of being passionate about vinyl and music or what was it that um, that got you interested in telling this story? So I think I think I speak for both of us. And, and, and when I say that, like Chris and I have been music people our entire lives, definitely. Um, we're both a little too young to have been vinyl people the first time around when it was the only way to listen to music. Uh, I, I think I'd say we're both of kind of the Sony Walkman generation. Um, <laughs> and the definitive musical moment in my young life was was the launch of MTV, which happened, mm -hmm. which happened the week of my eighth birthday. Um, so I, I think like the first record, like literal record, and this was on vinyl I ever bought was freeze frame by the Jay Giles band, because wow. it was just like, because the video was like a bunch of guys like squirting paint at each other. And I was like, man, that looks like fun. And like the album cover had a bunch of guys squirting paint at each other. And like, I was like, this is adulthood. Like you get to have a paint fight and, and, and you don't get in trouble with anybody. Like this, this sounds great. Um, so, uh, so that was like my, but quickly it was cassettes and then CDs. And I think both of us have kind of followed the different technological iterations of music since then. And it was quite by accident that we both found our way back to records later on. I was, I, I, I had purchased a turntable from someone I knew for a song, basically because he was getting rid of it and it was cheap. And I figured I could, I could do something with it at some point. I didn't know what. Um, and, at the time, I, I had no idea that vinyl was in the process of a renaissance when I did that. Mm. So to me, vinyl just seemed like a really cheap way to be in like, oh, I don't know, like music secondary school forever, you know, like like really cheaply. And this was, this was of course, before streaming. So really cheaply, I could be like, okay, this semester is, this semester is like Western Canadian punk. And next semester is like, is like Bulgarian classical. And the semester after that is, is, you know, Nigerian hip hop and on and on and on and on. And it just sounded like a really fun way to learn about music. Mm -hmm. um, and then like, I found that we found out that, that vinyl had been on, uh, on a tear. And, um, and that's really when, when Chris and his family kind of uh, decided to get back into the media a little bit later than me and, and when, when the Renaissance was in full bloom. Yeah, I guess I should pick it up a little bit there. Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. I think my wife and I got a turntable in 2014 and 
I you know I, I just like Kevin I was more the cassette and then CD generation I'm, I'm just two years younger than Kevin um, and so I have memory of, of records like with the Fisher Price turntable and Sesame Street you know albums but not much more beyond that uh, but something that was really fascinating to me was um, that I didn't even realize what was happening you know as as we evolved from CDs to MP3s and iTunes and then Spotify I, I became really disconnected uh, to music my relationship to music just uh, it was honestly, it just felt like tenuous at best. I just wasn't as into it as much. And then when we got our turntable and we started buying records, all of a sudden it's like, I was like rediscovering music again. And it wasn't just, you know, the albums that I had loved when I was growing up and now having them on vinyl, but it was listening to new music and realizing like, I, I really want to listen to that whole album. And if, if it's available as a vinyl record, I want to go get that and, and listen to it. And I've always been a person who's enjoyed listening to an entire album as opposed to just individual tracks. And so just again, vinyl records has just been a natural way for me to, to reconnect with music. And then um, before Kevin came to me with the idea, my, my daughter who's now 17, she got her first turntable when she was 13, just on her mm -hmm. own and started collecting records. And that was just so fascinating to me that's here's someone of a generation who has never owned music in a physical format at all just knows music through itunes and spotify and streaming and downloads and now all of a sudden wants to own records and listen to records and that's like okay what's what's going on here so <laughs> I, I was curious to learn more about that and her generation's uh, attraction to the music and how they also have been a huge driver in this resurgence of vinyl records it's interesting you mentioned that our son's 10 years years old and we got him a turntable for his birthday last year. That's that's what he wanted. Or maybe it's two years ago now. I don't know. The last 16 months is such a weird blob of, uh, but same thing. He's got his little record collection and he listens to his vinyl all the time. I, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the, the point about, uh, and you both really have mentioned this, the, the connection um, you feel to the music through vinyl. And uh, I mean, there's been a lot written uh, in the in the past couple of years, really about um, especially with the rise of you know like Spotify and Apple Music and all the streaming services, uh, almost uh, you know the headline is the death of the album. You know we've become this single driven. So you know you listen to a song on a streaming service and then they're like, great if you like this song, now you might like these. So great they're they're and a lot of it might be new music you haven't heard, but it's not full full albums um and that is i mean that's so foreign to me because that's how i grew up listening you listen to the whole album you're you're always prepared for the last song on side two to be kind of weak <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> unless it's purple rain or something like that exactly. <laughs> um but as far as the connection that's what i i, I want to explore that a little bit because one of the beautiful things about record collecting is um, it is the sense of community. It's a sense of being able to be alone and, you know, alone at home with your music and your thoughts, but it's that social aspect of whether you're going to a record show or a record store and browsing through everything. Uh, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on um, what the pandemic in particular has done to hopefully not permanently sever that, uh, that feeling or those ties. We were, we were very worried about that when we finished the movie in 2020 and we're like, and increasingly it became clear that we were not going to be able to show it in person to anybody, at least not for the foreseeable future. And, and, you know, we had big plans. We were like, we were like, it's a screening. And then, you know, maybe we have the local record store come and sell vinyl. Or maybe we say, listen, we're going to be at the local record store tomorrow at 10. Come by and we'll all dig together. Like, like we had some, we had, we had big plans. Um, we're just going to, we're just going to do those things this year or next year. But, <laughs> um, uh, but at the same time, you know, and then, and then, our movie came out two days before, you know, two months before record, our movie was finished two months before record store day uh, in April of 2020. And so we were like, we're like, this is, this is really bad. Like this is the biggest day of the year for record stores. And they, they literally are not legally allowed to open their front doors. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when we decided to show Vinyl Nation for one weekend that week, the weekend of record store day and digitally and say, listen, a ticket is 10 bucks. Um, if you're an independent record store, 
sell tickets and and you guys keep 100% of the proceeds. We're, we're, we're more than happy to do that because should we emerge from all of this and, and what is in Vinyl Nation looks like a memory instead of the present, that would, that would kill us both. Like, like, like I, I, I think we would regret having made the movie, which, which would have been terrible. Um, luckily, it didn't work out that way. We raised almost $40,000 for independent record stores. And that was really- Wow. Yeah, it was really, it was a really significant moment for us. And not only because we felt like we did some good for the ecosystem that had been so good to us and made such a difference in our lives, but at the same time, we also feel like had we gone the conventional route, you know, film festivals in hopes of picking up a distributor and if not taking it on a road show yourself and like, and those kinds of things, um, we would have had to do this essentially one city at a time, which, mm-hmm. would have, which would have been fine, but there's no way we could have made as many friends as quickly as we made them had, had mm-hmm. we not done it this way. And, and that's been the remarkable thing. You know, like Chris and I are only two people. Like if this was, if these were normal times and we had to go to, and, and we, we wanted to go to each of the 20 film festivals that, that, that Vinyl Nation has been an official selection of before, we, we can't be in that many places at the same time. Um, and we've managed to, um, because of these conditions, ironically, we've managed to like make friends in different cities in different countries on different continents, like, like all kind of at once. And it's been, it's, it's been really remarkable. Yeah, it has been a weird, that, that's kind of the weird paradox of this whole thing, right? It's like the trade-off is you don't get to experience your movie with an audience and that d- immediate connection. And yet you can reach so many more people so much faster because of the technology we have. It's a yeah. very weird paradox. That's very well put. Yeah. It was um, also, it was, I was just gonna say, it was also strange that yeah. we did that one weekend screening. Um, you know, people were so, they were sad that they weren't able to go to record stores. I and mean, it's like a celebratory event. It's more of like going and seeing people you only see maybe once a year in line. Uh, I feel like even more so than the records that you're buying, even though, you know, that's like the joy after that's all done is like, oh, look, I also have a stack of records to listen to now. <laughs> and, then, and people didn't have that. And it was, um, it was really exciting to have a lot of different people from all over the, the country here in the US where we did it. Um, reach out to us and say like, I, I, I watched it with my friends. We were all in our own homes, but we all watched it together and we were texting each other or we were you know, FaceTiming or we were Zooming at the same time or we did a watch party or whatever, live tweet. And they're like, there's, I kind of got a little of that sense of joy that I, that I was longing for, that I was missing that connection. So like, thank you so much. And I just think it helped remind people like we're, we're, I thought it was so early in the pandemic and it's just like, we're going to get through this somehow. And then on the, on the, on the other side of this, we get to get together again, however that is. And for a lot of us, it's like, we want to get together again at the record stores. Um, so that, that was really exciting for us. Well, you're right. I mean, we already lost all the record stores once, <laughs> you know, yeah, like exactly. through, yeah, through MP3s and, and streaming and everything. I mean, I was, a uh, you know, I, I was for years, um, I mean, I worked when I was younger for, there was a national chain in Canada called Sam the Record Man that was legendary. They had a mm-hmm. massive store on Young Street in Toronto and yeah. stores across the country. Um, there was HMV, which I worked for HMV for a, a good number of years. Uh, you know, they're all gone. You know, in the US, you've got, you know, like Tower Records, who in your wildest dreams ever would have imagined a world without companies like that right so now we see this resurgence and um and it's so important uh for for that yeah for for them all to survive why do you think the resurgence happened in the first place oh geez i I, i'm really glad we don't come to a conclusion on that in our movie (laughs) because because it it, it would be an eight-hour miniseries if we Mm -hmm. if we tried and um but some of the reasons we talk about are um, our records and streaming curiously go together. Um, we like to say that streaming is not the opposite, and it's said better in our movie than by us. But like we like to say, like streaming is not the opposite of records. Streaming is is the audition you go through to purchase records. Like <laughs> like you try something out on streaming for you know ten bucks a month, and then and then and then you you spend. 
eight times that in buying records for the things you discovered. Uh, um, so, uh, so there's that. There's there's the there's the idea that records are both are tactile and you can see them and hear them and touch them and smell them. They activate four of the five human senses. Um, you can taste them if you want, but we 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 probably recommend not to. Um, but, uh, <laughs> And also, like, there's something about. I'm, I'm sure there's nostalgia for people our age who who had who had records around the first time, mm -hmm. um, but there's also like like a certain retro cool associated with with records. I, I simplistically, I like to say, I like to say, um, the reason for the comeback of records is Mad Men. Like, like, what is more uh, what is more mid century cool than a record player? Uh, and many of the young people we talk to describe a kind of mid-century sort of loft aesthetic in their bedrooms that that a record player is a big part of. Chris, I feel like I've addressed like one quarter of the reasons we heard in the movie. Like, <laughs> I mean, I think that's the, that, that I think that's the core of it. The one other thing I think I would add to that is, um, I think when. Uh, when the iPhone comes out also in, in, in 2007, right at the point when vinyl, you know, hits its nadir. And now when you have that one device that's your phone, but it's also your music. And then when Spotify comes to here to our shores uh, in about 2011 or so, and it's like so easy to find like any, you think essentially any song, anytime, anywhere. Like I was saying earlier, I, I felt disconnected actually to my music. And I think people realize this convenience of being able to access their music anytime, anywhere they lost their relationship with the music and they were looking for something that was more tactile. And so to Kevin's point, like records activate more than just the sense of hearing. Uh, and, and they were looking for something that they could touch and that they could see, and they wanted to have that relationship and they didn't want to just give everything over to their phones and to the cloud everywhere. And uh, granted, there are people that just, they're, they go that direction entirely. And they would think, why would I want the challenge of, of records? And yet, <laughs> and yet we've had some of those people watch our documentary and go, man, I got to get a turntable now. Like I need to get some <laughs> records. It's like, yeah, you didn't know what you were missing, but also they realized they now have permission. They felt some people, as we have talked talk about in our documentary, they didn't feel like they had permission to listen to records. They thought that was for other people. They thought it was for the stereotypical older white male. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's actually always been for everybody. You just have only seen in the media it be portrayed that stereotypical way. But like, come on in. And also those record store owners you think are going to be like, nasty to you because you don't you don't know captain beefheart yeah that's a bit of an anachronism like no no no. the door's like wide open um women own record stores like they're really cool places that hang out and they want to introduce you to cool things like sure they'll they'll have you listen to captain beefheart but if you're looking for the newest <laughs> taylor swift it's over here too and you are more than welcome to buy that um so i think all those things have been interesting with like the, the rise of technology and how people have looked to something like their record players as a way to uh, again find that connection that they, they didn't realize they had given up yeah, and there's there's always been. I, I mean, I love the answer. Really, I think with the resurgence, yeah, it, it's 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 so personal. It's a different reason for everyone. Um, and uh, it's funny because there there have always been, you know, the stereotypical record shop, the music snob. You know, mm -hmm. we had them. I mean, when I was working in record stores, and I would just always laugh at them. I, I would always say, you know what, it's okay to like Radiohead but also admit you really love this Hanson song because it's just so damn catchy. There's nothing wrong with that. And if, if you think there is, you're closing yourself off to so much amazing music by saying like, well, this isn't cool. So I can't listen to it. It's yeah. like you are allowed to give yourself permission to listen to something that makes you feel good. Yeah. I mean, what is Hanson other than the, the, Tulsa, Oklahoma, religious version of the Jackson five. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, uh, you know, and, and they've lasted longer than the Jackson five at this mm -hmm. point. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I feel like there, there's always the thing that records encourage you to do. And we hope that we got at in this movie, Vinyl Nation is, is the, the, the metaphor of I like to read the liner notes is always like, I want to know more. I want to know where the music I like is connected in history, in time, in culture, um, who made it, who they learned from, who they inspired later on. I, I, I just feel like our, our, our music is that much more special and complete. The, 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 the record leads us that way. 
Um, we don't, we're not as, we're not as, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to be something that's so sort of present and here today and gone tomorrow. Because like, if music is special to you, like I understand there's, I have plenty of diehard music fans in my life who, who say music is like a river. You, it just keeps flowing and you just dip your toe in every now and then. And <laughs> I understand that. Like, I, I prefer to think like music's like a university. Like you, you spend, you know, a university that you never have to graduate from. You never really have to pay that much tuition at. Like you, <laughs> uh, you just, just stay there learning forever. And, um, and I think, I think that's amazing, but I think records, um, provide us with that really that really deep knowledge of music that deep rich kind of experience with music there's also that feeling of um you know you i think maybe chris you alluded to this earlier um but the the whole tactile part of it there's something about there's something about turning on your phone and letting you know a streaming service their algorithm tell you what you might want to like based on what you've already listened to. And I have discovered some great artists that way. Don't get me wrong. Me too. Uh, it's, it's amazing technology, but there's something about walking to a record shop and just flipping, flipping, flip, and then just be like, Ugh! that like, I've been looking for this for 12 years or, you know, whatever it is. Right. There's mm -hmm. something to that. Isn't there, isn't that, isn't that just so, uh, it gives you this like endorphin rush almost. Oh, yeah, and we have characters in our in our film that that talk to exactly that point. Like you know, you're, you're you don't get that feeling if you're just looking through playlists on Spotify. And again, Kevin and I both use Spotify. We listen to Spotify. We both subscribe. Like again, as we've been talking about, that's how a lot we audition a lot of music and say. You know, I've been listening to this now a couple times. I should buy it. And again, if it's available on a record, that is what I want to own. Um, so we, we have no issue, you know, with, with streaming, but there isn't that joy, that excitement of, of digging through the crates and finding something you didn't know you were looking for. Um, but on, on our journey, as we were filming, you know, we had the benefit of going to many record stores, but we basically tried not to shop because we didn't have time. That being said, we went to record stores and we went to pressing plants and more than once, somebody offered us a record which we would never turn down. Um, and I know we were, uh, when, when, when this would happen, the first question they ask is, what are you into? And I, I would just, I learned fast, I'm like, no, nope, no. See, the problem with the algorithms is the algorithm says, oh, you like this, so you will like this other thing. And I'm just too stuck in my lane. And I wanna discover new music, not something that's like, adjacent to what I already listened to. Like, I want something from left field that I didn't know I was gonna like. Mm -hmm. So when people would say, well, what are you into? I said, nope. I want you to give me something that you think I should be listening to right now. And that's how some of the best music like came into our life. So like the real quick story, when we were at Gold Rush Vinyl, a new pressing plant in Austin, Texas, Karen Kelleher made us that offer. And I said, no, don't tell me. So she put a record in my hands and I looked at it and I, just from the reaction on my face, she took it out of my hands. <laughs> like, I don't, I, she's like, that's actually not for you. And I was like, oh, okay. And then she put a different record into my hands. And then <laughs> I was like, oh, I actually had a different reaction. And it was, Grizz, Ride Waves. And I didn't know who Grizz was. And as soon as I looked at it, I was like, oh, this is this looks great, thank you. And then other people on the crew who knew who Grizz was was like, oh, uh, could I get a copy of that? That's what I want? And they're like, oh, sure. And I took it home, put it on the turntable. I was just blown away. And it sat on my turntable for a long time, so much so that I pushed to get it into our movie and the, the end credits track is Grizz's The Escape. And I just really wanted to share with the audience something that had been shared with us on our journey from somebody. And again, had I said, oh, I'm into X, Y, Z, Grizz, Ride Waves, never would have landed in my hands. And it's one of my favorite albums. That's such a great point. I think the algorithms are similar to, you know, really what social media does, you know, like Facebook and that. It's like, it's, it's almost uh, the echo chamber. It's like, you like this, so we know you will like this. We don't want you to color outside the lines. Uh, and, um, you know, there's that great scene in High Fidelity where it's like, watch this, you know, put the record on and everyone in the store is like, oh, what is this? That is so true. I, I can't tell you the number of times that happened you know, on a daily basis in my record store years, it's true that people want to discover new music, you know, and um, that's what I think is just so wonderful about this story. And man, I don't know. I don't know if there's been a time we needed this movie more. <laughs> oh, that's really <laughs> nice right of you. Now. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the other, the, thing, the other thing that we hope people get from our movie is, is and not, and not to slag on algorithms or anything, but algorithms presuppose a lot about us based on our race, our gender, our age, uh, how much money we have or make, uh, where we live. Um, and, um, and, I, I, and, and, and in the course of doing our movie, A, it was very important to us that the 40 people we featured in it all looked very different from one another. Mm. And yet at the same time had this thing in common um, because it's our supposition in Vinyl Nation that record people are actually everybody. And, um, and B, everybody is actually into more kinds of music than they think they're into. Mm -hmm. They just, they just haven't met it yet. Just like, just like strangers or friends they haven't met yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like we, Listen, we have no issue if if person X is the kind of person who discovered, you know, 60s Delta Blues music and 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 was was happier than a pig in slop and was like, I'm just going to stay here for the rest of my life. OK, that's cool. Um, but don't presuppose that person wouldn't like, you know, Manchester techno just because they like Delta Blues music. I mean, that's that's a that that's a presumption based probably more on on the the race, gender, ethnicity of that person than it is anything having to do with music. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, so we it was that was really it was real was really that was one of the great lessons we learned from this movie, and hopefully we hope we hope that people got from Vinyl Nation that like we are all more musically interesting than we think we are. <laughs> yeah, actually, real quick behind the scenes story uh, uh, based on what Kevin was just saying, when we interviewed uh, Roz Lee in her, at her home in Harlem, uh, as we were setting up, Roz naturally just put on a record for us to listen to while we're getting ready. And um, over the course of setting up, uh, Kevin noticed that everybody on the crew at some point in time went over to the turntable to see what we were listening to. Because we were like, this is awesome. What is this? And it was BT Express's uh, second album, Nonstop. And, and, oh. and, I, and I'm not into disco or funk, but it was just like, this has got a great groove. Um, so they're like, that, that's, this is, you know, we're just just grooving to it before we get we got into shooting and Kevin made a point like hey that's pretty cool that we all went over there so the very next day we drove down to Baltimore and we filmed at Hair's Breath Records uh, a small record store at Fells Point which sadly didn't survive the pandemic but however when we were there to interview Cat Peach after the interview Kevin started looking through the racks and Cat had so many great used records and Kevin found not one, but two copies of BT Express's nonstop. So he's like, oh my God, I got, I have to get these. He tells Kat the same story. Like we just discovered this record yesterday with our last interview. And um, Kat's like, they're yours, just take them. Like our gift for you coming to talk with us. We're like, oh my God, that's fantastic. And so again, uh, another one of these albums that doesn't never would have found its way into my life if we hadn't gone and done this movie and somebody put on a record and then the next day in a totally different city, there it is in the shelves, not one, but two copies. So it's like serendipity, we have to own this record now. (laughs) Yeah, and and by the way, like Cat Peach and her husband, Matt, who owned that store are musicians too. And they were really, and they play like, they're really into like, you know, old like British folk music, you know, like, like, like maybe Fairport Convention is the modern equivalent of what they're into, but they play stuff like you'd hear from the 19th century. And then you're like, oh, is that going to be what's in their record store? And it's like, no, their record store was entirely soul and funk music. And then, (laughs) and then while we were in there, some people who had been visiting Baltimore from Philadelphia, like stopped in because they used the bathroom across the street. And, and they just had handfuls and handfuls of records. And the guy was like, I, I started chatting with the guy. I'm like, what are you into? And he goes, oh, you know, like 70s classic rock, like Elton John and Led Zeppelin. I'm like, that's cool. Are you finding what you're looking for? And he's like, yeah, but there's a lot of like, there's a lot of like stuff here, like that says soul and funk on it. And I just don't know much about that. Um, I'd like to. And I said, and I was like, I was like, all right, well, like, what are you into? And he's like, He's like, well, I really like piano music like Elton John. And we're like, okay. And so we like, I, I, I like, because I was just standing near Iraq, I like pointed at him to some like Booker T and the MGs and some <laughs> Dr. John and stuff like that. And I'm like, piano music, but more what you're looking for. He's like, okay, man, good. <laughs> and then like, he just threw four of those on the stack and off he went. I mean, that's, that's what we hope we're getting at with this thing. Like, um, and it wasn't because, Cat and Matt are, su- are are such great salesmen. They are, and it wasn't because like I'm such a wonderful guy. Eh, 
highly debatable, <laughs> but like <laughs> it was just it was it was just because because records create that human connection between people um, that is just there when you're in that environment, um, you know, no matter who you are as people. Well, I thank you two for your human connection today. Uh, let's hope the next time we all chat, it's in person uh, over a record. I think that would be absolutely wonderful. Uh, perhaps we'll have to do a, an in-person encore screening at some oh. point down the road. I mean, I think that'd be great because that's, you know, you mentioned it earlier, but that's absolutely one of the things we would have been doing is like, get one of the local record shops in the lobby of the theater, selling some vinyl, like really do it up, you know, and, and, um, that might be lost, but you know what? People can sit at home uh, this week and they can discover this wonderful film and they can reach out to you guys on social media, I assume. What's mm -hmm. the best way to connect with you guys? Uh, the movie's website is VinylNationFilm.com. On social media, on Facebook and Instagram, we're VinylNationDoc, D-O-C. Uh, and, and I'll say, I think I speak for both Chris and I, Guy, when I say that like, in the course of being on the festival circuit, someone sent us a map of the record stores in Calgary. So we now have a totally inflated expectation of, of record stores uh, in Alberta. And we are, we are expecting the same thing out of Edmonton. Okay. We are expecting, okay. so, <laughs> so when we come to this screening, we have, we have wildly inflated expectations for the kind of digging we will be doing. Um, yeah, we're going to have to take a head-to-head at -head. Edmonton yeah. Calgary. Who's, who's going who's gonna to win out here? In the yeah, I'll well, just bury us with a smile on our face. But like... <laughs> you got it. I will yes. send you a map. <laughs> please, please. We would All like right, that. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, Vinyl Nation screening, obviously, online from May 6th to 16th, northwestfest.ca. Gentlemen, see you on the B-side. A pleasure, Geek. Keep spinning. Thanks, Geek. Appreciate it.